Yep. So I'll just uh, open the floor now to general questions. Yep. Uh, we'll uh, perhaps put the chairs out the front. Look them in the face. Yep. That'll be good. Yep. Yep. And so you, you've been given a bit of time to sort of reflect on the other speakers' presentations, and uh, you can uh, uh, you know, fire away to them. Hmm. Oh, here we go. We've got one to start with. Yep. Will Lima yield and inequality become a bigger part of your breeding objective at the expense of increasing growth? Who are we going to fire that at? Are we looking at Hamish? Oh, I guess we are, yep. Um, would, would you like me to uh, answer that or would you like the, the breeders to have uh, some input into that one? Rodney, you're smiling back there. Did you uh, care to have some input into that or was that your question in the first place? From my perspective, Sarah I guess there's only so much selection pressure to go around. So, um, you know, if you're taking, uh, if you're going to place more selection pressure on a particular trait, then that gives you less uh, selection pressure for the traits that you've already been selecting for. So on that basis, I guess it does mean, yes, you are going to have less emphasis on growth. You will therefore perhaps uh, make less progress for that trait. Um, but I, I question the wisdom of continuing to go down the track of producing more and more of a particular trait that if it falls below certain thresholds for quality, um, people are going to you know, start paying less for it. So let's knock that one around a little bit. Yep. I was just going to make a comment. From, from my uh, f feedlot work um, with the cattle in my previous life, um, I don't think the trait that we should be looking at is any particular biological trait. I, I think the trait should be value. So that's your economic index and it should be a balanced multi-trait index, whatever that's in it. Yeah, and could I just add, following on, uh, Alan Piggott here, I think David's graph up there sort of showed the answer to that question, that ultimately the consumer is the one that's at the top of the tree. So eating quality has to be our highest priority. Lean meat yield's important for the processes, but if the consumer's not buying the product, well, it's not much use to him. Growth rates are important for the finishes, but again, if the product's not right, there's no use to us. So I think the eating quality ultimately has to be our highest priority. Oh, I think it's been Yeah, Rodney Watt, I was just going to say that, you know, right from the start when we got into uh, land plant, sheep genetics, whatever, every other year we have another trait that comes on board and we have to uh, reduce our commitment to increasing growth rate and accommodate that uh, new trait. But if you actually look at the, the sorts of breeders that are breeding the best sheep on sheep genetics, they've accommodated all those traits and they're still leading the race in terms of, of uh, growth rate. So... It's just a matter of being smarter in your selection process and, and accommodating these things, and you'll still make plenty of uh, you'll still make plenty of increases in growth rate. Yep. Thank you, Rodney. Yep. I, I thought with the uh, stuff that Janelle showed us before, that um, there wasn't an impediment on growth rate because of selection for lean meat yield and eating quality. So really, you should be looking at the correlations between the two before you even discuss whether it's a negative or a positive. Daniel, can you fill in any of the correlations at the moment between growth and IMF? Uh, I wouldn't have thought that it was positive across the whole database. Andrew, that question was handballed to you. Uh, correlations. <laughs> I could give my talk now, <laughs> but as you see, sorry, yeah, as you see tomorrow, I mean, the, um, uh, um, I'll show you an index which uh, tries to balance lean meat yield and eating quality, and um, well, several different options, and um, um, in all of them, growth rate is is about the same and still going up um, quite nicely. Yeah, that's a good advertisement for Beanie tomorrow. If you want to get the fine detail, Andrew's going to lay it on the table there. Yep. Yep, Jeff. In the very early trials that I can remember we were doing, uh, every, 
er, the younger the animal were, the more tender they were. So that is a con that's a contributor to eating quality. So if you're high growth and you get to 25 kilos at a quicker rate, then that's go also going to improve eating quality. So I don't think growth is a big problem as long as we keep in mind the, the fleshing on the animal as well. But I don't think growth is a problem. I, if we can get... We don't need to go to 30 kilos. We need to go to a target weight and just get it there quicker. And the chicken industry approved that. Like, you, can, you don't find a tough chicken in the shed. It tastes like shit, but it's... <laughs> 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 but, but it's still very tender. But uh, So I, I don't see a problem with growth interfering with eating quality. I'd actually support that. So growth, um, the, the trait growth is relatively benign in its impact on either um, lean meat yield or eating quality. Um, if you get an animal to slaughter weight younger, it'll tend to be leaner and have less intramuscular fat, but the collagen connective tissue means that it's tenderer offsetting that. So therefore it ends up being a pretty benign trait in terms of those factors. The big, uh, the big interaction is between lean meat yield and eating quality. That's the, uh, that's the real problem child. Uh, Troy? I guess my comment is just it, it sort of boils down to the correlations. While the correlations are less than one, you'll find animals that tick the boxes. There aren't many of them yet, but um, there are animals that are in the database that are trait letters for lean meat yield, eating quality and growth. So I think you can have your cake and eat it, or in this case, your chop and eat it. Can I just get a, ask a question of the, of the group? Uh, can we just have a show of hands? I think I can ask this question. Who's actually uh, uh, got... RBVs on some rams for lean meat yield and eating quality. Let's have a show. Yep. Okay. All right. So good percentage of you have. That's fantastic. Yep. Um, uh, have a think about what your problems are with that bit of technology that you're getting. Rodney sort of said, yep, we just add another trait and we work with it sort of thing. But some of you are going to have some problems. Let's have a couple of those come out on the table after we've heard from Stefan here. Um, as, as a commercial lamp producer, I would be hesitant to select rams on carcass quality at the expense of growth because at the moment I'm making money out of growth and there are no market signals there for me to produce lambs of better eating quality. When that balance becomes the other way, where eating quality is going to attract a premium, there won't be enough rams in the country with RBVs to supply the need. Yep, so no time like the present. That's today to make a start. Yep, excellent. So that, so let me ask you, um, what are your problems? Oh, sorry. sorry. Oh, yeah, Dave. I was just going to say, that's, that's right, that's very here and now, but there's a, a couple of generation interval before you can multiply those rams up and get them out into the commercial field. And if we lose our market and we lose our customers, we're stuffed. So we're not putting market signals out for yield. Uh, I've worked out last year, I did a, a yield trial um, to work out what a millimetre of fat costs us in trimming in the, in the boning room. Um, and I'm not going to penalise fat lambs yet until we can control eating quality. Um, we have a discount for one score lambs because that's sort of like MSA discounts, not having enough condition on them but we pay the same price up to five score. So, uh, yep. yep. Thank you, Dave. Yep. 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 Barry. Yep. I've, got, I've got a question, probably a little bit uh, left field from this, but I was talking to a uh, pig producer last week and he supplies um, 800,000 pigs a week, sort of thing, and he brought in some uh, Canadian pigs to um, improve his eating quality but he also brought in a stress gene. Now, I just wondered, um, from the sheep genetics point of view, and perhaps CRC and the research, what sort of research are we doing on stress and you know, genes in our sheep that are related to stress? So by the stress gene, are you talking about porcine stress syndrome? Yeah, is, that, is that what you're referring to? Yeah, so that was a, uh, that, that was a point mutation associated with a... Oh, there's a, a little um, calcium channel in the muscle tissue that, um, that underpins that. And it was almost a, uh, a case of bad luck that that got pulled through with um, a, a sire that was particularly good for lean meat yield. 
the, the industry woke up to it after several generations down the track and all of a sudden they had this por porcine stress syndrome that was causing pale, soft, exudative meat right through the industry. And, um, and then they had to, you know, they, they basically traced it back and worked out the original sire that, uh, that had infused that. And it's been a, a, a real problem within the pig industry ever since, and I, I think they've addressed it quite solidly in, in recent years and sorted it out mostly. Like, the other name for it was the halothane gene. Is that ringing a bell with you? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, okay. So, in effect, really, what you're referring to is the need to keep a finger on the physiological pulse of animals as we genetically diverge them and pursue these extreme traits. And that's one of, the, one of the great things about the nucleus flock experiment, the current nucleus flock, and the, the previous information nucleus flock. So at the outset of that experiment, we, we sat back, the meat science team, we sat back and we said, well, what, what are the things that are likely to go wrong if we go flat out selecting for lean meat yield, um, for, uh, for leanness in the carcass, massive growth rates, um, or, or potentially a whole raft of other traits. Likewise, the, uh, the on-farm guys did similar things. Um, you know, what impacts on reproduction could there be? And then once you start measuring all of those things, so you get the scientists together, they come up with the traits, you measure everything you possibly can, and you track where the problems are starting to emerge. And, and obviously this lean meat yield eating quality interaction is a classic outcome of doing precisely that. We're only good as our ability to predict what might come up. So I, I'm not saying that we're foolproof and that we'll pick up everything, but I, I think the structure is in place within the industry through the, the ongoing nucleus flock experiment to continue monitoring in exactly the ways you're describing and the sort of experiments that, that the research community comes up with and then hangs off that resource of animals are, are structured precisely to address questions that come up. So I, I think we've got a very good mechanism in place right now. Thank you, Graham. Yeah, Dave would like to add to that. Yep. Uh, I was just going to talk about uh, a, a ge genetic uh, mutation in the sheep breed uh, that came out of America that we mapped. It was the Calpage uh, gene. And uh, as a heterozygote, it's called the beautiful butts, it was big, nice yielding uh, terminal progeny. But if you got two copies of it, it developed the spider lamb syndrome with long skinny legs and it was uh, lethal. Um, so Adelaide University uh, validated the gene uh, mapping program for that uh, several years ago. So those things are there. So that was a high yielding um, genetic mutation, but unfortunately it was lethal. And that was um, distributed quite widely, I understand, in the American uh, sheep production lamb, lamb industry. So that's just on that front, actually within the lamb production industry. Thank you, David. Yep. Okay, we've got a question on notice for Dave on the board. Let him have a bit more chance to think about that. Other questions? Yep. Roger Truick, um, ram producer at Belmore, Victoria. Um, the sheep trials of sheep CIC are widely known by the people in this room, but I, I think in the broader community, especially the, uh, the average producer, they haven't a clue of what's going on. And I think we lack the uh, ability at this stage to pass that information through to them. And I think there should be a concerted effort to get that information out into the broader community. And I'm wondering how that can be addressed. Yeah, I think it's to you, Hamish. Yep. <laughs> thanks. If you just stand up, thanks. Yep. Yep. Uh, um, <laughs> Oh, you were. Okay. The, the Stand up, Bruce. We'll just compare. Yeah. Um, look, I, you know, I guess there's ongoing requirements for extension campaigns. Um, you know, I guess uh, from sheep genetics perspective, you know, we're in a position to deal with, you know, people like yourself from uh, seed stock breeders. Um, with our resources, we aren't really in a position to, to deal with you know, extension, message, extension messages for the entire industry, but I think certainly if we need to make sure that we're dealing with the appropriate communication channels with MLA, AWI, Sheep CRC and so on to, to make sure that 
those messages get out there. Um, you know, I think from our perspective, um, you know, it's the outcomes of those sort of bits of research, you know, what do people need to take from that to implement into their breeding programs um, and influence the direction that the, uh, the, the breeding flock is hopefully going to go in over the next few years. So, um, you know, from, from my perspective, that's, that's uh, our sort of uh, route to, to getting information out to people. Um, I'm sure there's, there's other perspectives and, and uh, other people working in that, that field that might be able to add to it. So Hamish, perhaps I will, and I'll just reiterate again, like the, you know, the, the power in seed stock producers hosting workshops on farm for current clients and also prospective clients, um, you know, is it, just huge. You know, th those days, whether it's Ram Select Workshop, Bread Well, Fed Well, you know, and, and two or three others in, in that, that space, you know, the producers go home extremely empowered and invigorated, you know, from the R&D that goes in behind that allows them to make commercial decisions that will actually increase their bottom line in terms of the type of lambs they produce or, in Martin's case, the wool that they produce. Martin? Thank you. Martin Oppenheimer. Um, just to follow on from, from um, the question and Hamish's response uh, uh, fits in perfectly with, um, well, some of the things I've been banging on with the, the good people from Cheap, cheap Genetics, uh, even simple things like the cards that we print off, we can print off for, for RAM sales. So in this case, we've heard all the you know, great work of Janelle and all the people that contributed to that work, and that's proved you know, some of the, um, the value of the RBVs. Um, so why don't we print that little um, helix symbol on the, um, on the sale cards? Why don't we have room on the sale cards for um, intramuscular fat and the other new traits? Why don't we put it there? I mean, that's just an easy one. Um, so simple things, you know, you can have a whole campaign, Hamish, that, you know, uh, creates awareness, but just the simple things on for sale ramps to have that information if they have been genotyped, um, put, just print it, because it all comes off the website. On the website, it's already there. All that information's there. Who's going onto the website? Well, you guys know, but not everyone. So if you, you, we've already got that information. It's not that hard. It's just a pretty practical way of extending that sort of information. It creates awareness. It creates questions. And, you know, yes, you probably need a workshop to fully explain it, but there are simple ways that we can actually start using that information with, with um, commercial sheep breeders right now. Did, Andrew, did you want to add to that? Uh, no, it's, no. it's a little bit broader again. OK, just hold up there. Yep. So, Hamish, did you, did you want to respond to that? Like, pen, you know, supporting information wherever we can... You know, and the pen cards as an example. Um, yeah. Look, you know, I think that was probably more of a, a statement than a question, but... Um, no, I know, think the I, question was, when are you going to allow that data up on the pen cards? Um, or aren't you? Uh, well, I think in terms of what goes on to pen cards, at this point in time we're looking at reporting breeding values so people can make a selection decision. Uh, if you've got eating quality traits available, yes, they should be going on the pen cards. Um, you know, DNA information is the same as any other form of you know, collecting information to calculate breeding values. So I think the important thing is that there are uh, breeding values available for the trait people are interested in uh, so selecting on rather than what's gone into the analysis to, to allow us to calculate that information. You know, from, from the, uh, you know, from the end ram buyer's perspective, um, you know, if, if we have intramuscular fat breeding values on a pen card, then, you know, that should be the piece of information that they're wanting to ask questions about and how to use it. So, you know, I think the communication side of things, it, it's, a, it's an ongoing, um, you know, field that we've got to keep developing and do a better job on it and get information out any way we can. Um, and, you know, days like today are certainly part of that. You know, it's not just 100 people in this room that we're trying to get the message across to. Um, you know, there's clients also um, and other people uh, involved in the industry um, watching it on the web. All of that information is also getting recorded and will be available, you know, for the next couple of years as, as videos on, on the website and that sort of thing as well. Um, you know, talking about 
you know, media sort of releases and campaigns that can follow on from, from today. So, um, you know, the, the communication side of things is, is an ongoing area that needs, needs to be developed and um, keep looking at different ways of getting out uh, the message out there. You know, not, not going to argue with that at all. Thank you, Hamish. Yep. Uh, Andrew, hadn't forgotten. Yep. Yeah, I'm not sure how I'm going to even get around this question. It's a really broad view of a, a bit of a summary of the whole day to a, to a degree. We know the flock's small, you know, we know the price and the, and the pressure sometimes, you know, that you're under. You're trying to supply 15 to 20 percent, you know, take that on through your abattoir and keep that chain going. Um, I think the ewe flock in the country is at a tipping point where we're not sustainable and we're going to, you know, we can't even maintain our numbers. Mutton prices are ridiculously high um, and so there's a lot of slaughter of, of breeding ewes and things and, uh, you know, in that environment, trying to introduce enrollers, and I realise the people in this room are here and passionate and there's a big picture about the industry, but uh, we're really going to rely on the processes or something. Uh, Stefan covered, you know, why give up a bit of growth if that was required, hypothetically, yes or no, you know, to introduce these things when it's a profitable and we're trying to make our farms pay and maintain that sort of thing there. So we've got this overriding environment of really serious supply. Um, we're all committed in this room to try and you know, have a big picture view and things. And it gets frustrating when the Joe blogs down the road that does none of this, gets seven bucks a kilo for his lambs, you know, because there's a real shortage and things like that. So it's really, the biggest thing that I see that we're challenged that we're facing is really simply this numbers game and enough things to introduce this. Because if there was 100 million sheep in the country, you could send a price signal very easily. These are the quality, these are the standards, these are the things, use genomics and away we go. So realistically, and I guess Dave, it's a question to you, but it's everybody, it's the extension, how do we roll this out, how do we make this important, how do we do it in this overriding environment? And do you realist, realistically think with the demands on your business to keep that throughput, that you can, because we need a price signal is really the way to do it. And can we do it in that environment? So uh, yeah, I guess uh, supply is our biggest, uh, our biggest requirement. After that is weight and after that is quality. Um, so, yeah, the, there's, there's a couple more processes that are opening up too and competition is a bit hard and a bit tough and, and prices are high. You mentioned $7, I'm not even looking there yet. <laughs> um, so, I, I guess that's, that, that, that is a balancing act. Uh, we've got the uh, National Lamb Forecasting Committee meeting on Thursday down in Melbourne, so we're heading down to that just to see where things are at. We're at uh, 75 uh, million sheep at the moment, or thereabouts. Um, I had a little experience a few years ago. I worked for Dalriata Meat at, um, at Keith, and uh, we were producing all yearling beef, and we had Australia's best branded beef two years in a row called Terra Rossa. And we were going flat out and producing it, and it's gorgeous beef. Unfortunately, my wife learnt to like it, and I can't get it anymore. Um, <coughs> Things got a bit tight after the financial crisis and, and we were grain feeding our stock and we actually had to reduce production. And all of a sudden, our customers realised, shit, we can't get it. And they actually started paying for it and it was almost reduced, we had to reduce supply so that price went up so that it became viable for us to finish it. Right? It's a bit of a catch-22. So... I would be loath to put 100 million lambs out there, 100 million sheep out there before China demanded it. I'd be more inclined to follow the demand with supply. Uh, I think it's a really exciting position to think of ourselves on a global basis as a niche product rather than a bulk commodity. Um, and I think that's a good position to be in. To a degree, because it is a niche product, do we need to really take a view of a really branded niche product? Like, we're going to have SMA, we're going to have five and six, six star lamb and things like that. So, if the average price for lamb is $6 a kilo, uh, how do we put a system in place that the meat eating quality five star lamb gets eight of it and the, and the fly by nighter lamb that fills up the stuff gets five bucks? So, we still work on a $6 average because it's kind of what we need if we're going to really get that premium product and keep it in a niche market thing and let the consumers the right and we tell them, well, you buy a one-star lamb, you're going to get a pretty bad experience, you get a five-star, but 
So it, it gets back to individual animal information. Traceability. We've, sorry. It gets back to individual animal information and traceability. And so, yes, we are looking at hooks, and yes, we are looking at electronic tags, and um, I guess people don't have to put them in there. Our, our, uh, our stance as Thomas Foods is we don't believe in mandating um, electronic tags to the industry, but we think that the industry should look at them seriously uh, and consider if it's worthwhile in their business voluntarily adopting them. And I think you'll find we sell uh, six, we, we take 600 lambs a week from uh, Central Western Vic, uh, New South Wales from Tilpa there that goes straight to Wigman supermarkets as organically uh, grown and produced lamb. Uh, so that's a, a very niche um, branded product straight into America. Um, and it does come at a premium and I don't even know what that is, but it's, it's certainly up there. Um, and that's every Tuesday they come in and they're slaughtered. So there are those things going on. Is the ultimate goal potentially, could you foresee in the future, simply a price ridge based on individual lambs and an MSA standard thing where it's simply you get paid for the quality of what it is? That is your grid. So uh, I went to Canada just uh, a few years ago before I was here and... Uh, <coughs> I, I, the idea of having a golden square and a grid, I mean, we've got a grid from 18 to 30 or 16 to 32 kilos, anything above score one. That's not a grid, that's a footy oval, and no one falls <laughs> off it. Uh, so I've done some work and I've presented some ideas to the Beef CRC's Regional Combinations Project and trying to get at the, the golden cell, if you like. Or actually, I'd like to throw grids out and talk about continuous pricing. Right? And, and then we can get into small continuous rewards for small continuous improvements. And I went to uh, Canada and uh, I visited a business over there called uh, Ontario Pork. And they have a, a pig grid that's got 25 weight categories and 25 fat categories on it, 225 cells on there. It's effectively a smooth till. Um, you speak to someone like Wendy Umberger in the professions at the University of Adelaide who studied grid pricing in America and as soon as you get past 9 or 12 grids on a, on, on a, a, a grid, cells on a grid, it gets too complicated and they've discovered that quite coincidentally the grid favoured the processor and so the producer stopped using it. <laughs> I'm sure that was an accident. <laughs> um, Ontario Pork can maintain that incredibly complex grid because they are neither a producer or a processor, they're an independent body and they maintain a transparent grid with a smooth hill with an optimum in the middle so they can target consistent weight and consistent fatness. So there's, there's ideas out there that, that are as good or better than what we're developing at the moment where I think we can go. Um, but we've all got to want to go there. Graham? Yeah, Dave, just to add to that, I think the, the, there's a few key things that are required. Obviously, an individual carcass MSA system is the first. So there's, there's going to be no, no grid until that exists. Um, so once that's up and running, I think then you just need to look at the, the beef, like for a, a local homegrown example, just look at the beef scenario in Australia. And there's any number of, of branded products that aren't just setting the, the, the minimum pass score for MSA, which is similar to what Woolies are effectively doing, that are then going to the next level and saying, no, look, we're, we're going to set thresholds above that um, for eating quality that you need to jump over to, to get your product into our brand. So um, it'll, it'll become complex and diverse and, and innovative and, um, and you know, the, the, the sort of businesses that are directly in, in touch with their customers will, will start to create those markets. First step, we need the tool. Dave, we've got questions mounting up on the, on the whiteboard for you. Yep. So the first one, if technologies are successfully implemented to identify eating quality, what value differentiation, penalty or premium uh, will be implemented by the processors? Sorry, Bruce, that's the second one. Oh, OK. I've thought about the, I've thought about the first one. So, um, All right, yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, Ch China to 2020 want, want a lot of lamb. I've already said that we shouldn't oversupply. We should uh, undersupply and follow the market up. Um, I didn't realise they were importing, but it doesn't surprise me. They're importing a lot of breeding stock. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> I had a, uh, a, an animal science, uh, sorry, an agriculture student from uh, the Wade asked me to help him with his work experience last year. He's a 43-year-old successful Chinese businessman, gone back to university. He sells lifts in 26 countries around the world. Food is the next opportunity over there, um, and he sees that, and that's where he's heading. Um, <clears throat> he was telling me, we, we talk about the rich Chinese. Um, that's uh, people with more than seven million American dollars, so I'd be happy to be one of them. That's 10% uh, of the population. That's only 140 million people. <laughs> that's seven times the population of Australia or whatever it is. Um, they are the biggest consumers of uh, sheep meats in the world and they're by at least twice or more the biggest producers of sheep meats in the world. Um, they do have some problems and they probably need to implement some regulatory technologies because they don't want their own meat. If you've got seven million dollars you don't need to risk um, buying Chinese berries. Um, <laughs> So, they've, <coughs> and whether they've got uh, competition for space or land, they've got other issues and uh, it's probably going to be after 2020 before they can implement those regulatory technologies, so it'll be some while away before they can compete. It's not saying that they can't compete and there's always competitors out there and we need to stay ahead of them. Thanks, Dave. Yep. I'll think about yep. it a second. When, when we started discussion, we were talking about um, sale cards for rams, and that's where my, my um, answer sort of comes in. But someone made a comment earlier on in the afternoon here that most farmers think there's too much already on the cards, and I tend to agree with them. Um, David just said that nine to ten um, preferences on, the, on a grid in America, and suddenly everybody switched off. And I think that's where you do find you do have contract with your clients before the sales, and I think if anybody wants to go a specific course, then I think that's where you cover that part and, and, let, and individually look after that client, what his needs are. And on that card, you really need the basics, and anybody else that really um, wants to know something different, I'll probably have about eight or ten clients that want different things that I don't put on my card, but I do send it out with a, a letter before and explaining and, and giving them that there. So. I think we've got to keep them, those cards fairly simple so that there's, there's a lot of people do switch off if, you, if you've got 25, 30 um, EBVs on there and they'll put a line through about 10 of them any rate, so. And when you get that many on a page of a catalogue, it's pretty hard to read them at our age too, Steph. Yep, we'll just give Dave one more uh, uh, relief and then he can have a go at the second question. Yep, so it's Stephen. Hi. I was just going to mention, if you want to talk about catalogues, there's two blokes down the halfway down the this side of the room, sitting next to one another. You need a week to study their catalogue, and they have one of the highest RAM averages in Australia, because the people that go to their sale want every bit of that information. Each animal's data covers two pages. Thank you, Stephen. I, uh, I knew we should have had some ground rules. Any free advertising means you've got to put something on the bar. But uh, 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 given I can't do that, Red. No. <laughs> well, it wasn't Jeff and Brian. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Dave, how are you going on that second? Oh. I think Bruce, you can do it retrospectively. <laughs> uh, so on that, uh, I've got a piece of uh, string in my pocket that's this long. Uh, it, it, it's a bit of a, a hard one. We don't have the data and so we can't actually relate it to market prices um, at this stage. Uh, there are studies around looking at pr willingness to pay and price points. Uh, Adelaide Uni has been, Wendy Umberg has done some of those things. Um, 
and it'll, it'll take those sorts of studies to be able to make those comparisons and when we get the technology to measure it, maybe we need to go down that path and, and work out what it's worth. Uh, the market will eventually work it out, but uh, you know, uh, we, we, we don't know at this stage what those numbers will be. Okay, yep. One more question from the floor, and then we'll just get Graham Gardner to sort of pull it together about what he thinks are the four or five steps. Yep. <laughs> just uh, say three or four key steps going forward, Graham. Yep. I guess my, my question just relates probably more to nutrition. We haven't talked a great deal about it. And, um, Janelle touched on it. I guess the question for Janelle is across the farm, you know, my real question is did the Faber Beans farm stand out for eating quality or I guess my broader question is are there well-known nutritional regimes that we can lift eating quality um, significantly above and beyond any genetic effects? It, it's... Um in this trial, um, to compare farms is, is probably not fair because there's different lambing times, there's different ewe base, um, all of those different things. Did you say was the beans one? Oh, no, um, but the <laughs> because that's confounded about which plant it was processed at as well. So it was processed at an export plant um, that relies on shipping the product for six months or six weeks overseas so it gets its ageing there rather than the, the 12 days ageing we allowed it. So, so there, there's confounding things on that as well. So we can't actually say, yes, this, this feed works better than that feed. But feed, feed affects growth rate and growth rate affects um, the glycogen that's laid down that affects your eating quality is one of the traits that affect it. So, so that's where nutrition and that affects the stress. The more nutrition you can get into the animal, the faster the growth rate. The, the easier it can deal with stress as well. So I personally don't think that there is any magic feed you can give to an animal to make it more tender or better eating quality. A grain versus grass, um, I think that probably would. We'll throw that to Graham, that's early smack He's work. He's putting yeah. his hand yeah. out yeah. again. So <laughs> Janelle, give him the microphone. Yep. Um, the, the, the feed story with respect to eating quality is depressingly simple. So uh, feed them well, grow them quick, kill them younger at the slaughter weight um, rather than killing them older at that same slaughter weight as a result of that. Um, so it's, it, it's depressingly simple. Yep. And we've, we have tried... I heard a few stories about nutritional supplements to, um, to avoid dark cutting. Um, I actually did a whole PhD on it, Bruce, back in the day. I still feel young, but apparently that was sort of 15 years ago. Anyway, um, the, the end result of that was feed them well. High energy, high glycogen, less dark cutting. And we tried glucot glucotrans, NutriCharge. Um, magnesium had a small effect. Magnesium oxide is an in-feed in, in supplement. In sheep only, don't use it in cattle. Um, we looked at the impact of high nitrogen diets and, and urea to potentially have a slightly negative effect. And even now there's a little bit of work, a background work going on um, looking at different pasture types on that front. But, um, but yeah, the, the overriding story is just very simple. Feed them well, grow them quick, kill them young. Thank, thank you, Graham. Okay, so I will close off the, co the discussion around that nutrition side of things and co call Graham ba back to the chair just to give us his three salient points, you know, on, on, on what next for the group of leading breeders here that are actually are, uh, got their toe in the water, you know, with uh, genomic breeding values, you know, for yep. lean meat yield eating quality. Yeah, what, what, what's next? Okay, so I had, a, I had a quick 20 second think about it, Bruce. So uh, I think we've... Um, Quite obviously, at, at the, the industry end of things, we need measurement. So that then we've got the ability to actually determine lean meat yield and eating quality. So you could argue that's step one. Step two is the people doing the measuring, which will be the processes, need to recognise its value. So, so that's step two. And use the information. By the way, that's hard to do. It's easy for me to, to put in throwaway lines, but they need to start working out how to make sorting decisions within their plants using that information to extract value from it. And that's, that's a big deal to change a process in an abattoir. Hang, hang on, let, let me finish up. I've got a train of thought here, Dave, and then you can fire up. So, so that's step two. 
So the processors have to realise the value, and of course once they do, they will then start getting fired up about attracting those type of lambs, and hence your price signal is in place. So I guess for me, it would then be sensible to try and construct some sort of project around those, but you know what, I think I'd be foolish to try to do them in isolation, because there'd always be lags. They sort of seem to have to happen all at the same time, and so that's precisely why through various groups at the moment, like the Sheep CRC, MLA, and coordinated through the Lamb Supply Chain Group, we are attempting to do all of those three things at the same time. So then it comes back to the question for breeders, and I'm not going to tell you what to do. You guys are businessmen and women. So you've got to make these decisions and forecast the future. My job is to tell you what I think the future will be, your job is to sit back and say, right, that's what's coming. Make your own pessimistic predictions about how long it's going to take us and then marry that up with the genetic progress decisions that you choose to make. Do you, for now, just chase growth or do you start getting on the front foot and start chasing lean meat yield and eating quality in combination? Thank you, Graeme. Yep, we'll hold yours. No, no, and, no, you, no, you, and you're here for dinner? I'm going to, if you're going to give me dinner, that'll be well. Yeah, all right, okay, yep, yep, <laughs> yep. So, yep, so, uh, Graeme, thank you very much for, for wrapping that up. You can obviously appreciate the journey that you've been on this afternoon. Definitely some challenges there uh, and, uh, you know, uh, some op opportunity to be captured and captured collaboratively. No one's going to do it on their own. They'll actually need to work together in a team, yep. Okay, um, so thank, if I could just ask you to join with me in thanking all the speakers for this afternoon's session.